For most of my life, I've ignored privacy policies. I've signed up for whatever service I wanted, because what's the big deal? They already have my data anyways, who cares? I've got nothing to hide. Plus, who wants to read a gigantic wall of text? It's a mind-numbing chore, and for a very long time, I didn't care to do it at all. When I was in my early 20s, I was very into the whole smart tech thing. I thought things like the Google Home were so cool, to the point that I had convinced many of my friends and family members to get some for themselves. They all listened to my suggestions because I worked in tech. I was trusted to understand tech, and I thought at the time that these smart speakers were the bee's knees. No worries here at all. I never once bothered to read a single privacy policy, and I had created yet another set of uninformed consumers. If you've seen any of my recent videos, you'll know that I have pivoted away from the world of smart tech. I mean, my thing is rejecting convenience. It's an expression I liked so much that I made it my channel name. As a part of that, I've been on a bit of a conquest to help people understand online privacy. While there are many reasons for this, I assume part of it has to do with the fact that I feel responsible for misleading my friends and family. I directly contributed towards something I now believe is a big problem. There's obviously a lot of nuance here, and I want to be very upfront about that. My goal here is not to scare you into not using services you want to use. While fear can be a great motivator, I do not believe it is the right thing to do. On the other side of it though, I don't want to present these things as perfect, pristine things. Because there is a trend in data collection that has had undeniably negative consequences. Most importantly, I don't want to make you feel dumb about any of this. With the whole smart speaker thing, I do not believe my family is dumb for not listening to me now. I mean, it's been almost a decade that they've used the dang things, and it's clearly well integrated into their lives. Change is hard, and I don't blame them for keeping it. Plus, I haven't been able to articulate my concerns without sounding like a paranoid maniac. This has been a learning process for me, too. Heck, let's call out some of that nuance right now. There are situations where smart speakers are wildly helpful for accessibility. It can be both a good and a bad thing. I know I said this a lot in the last video, but we need to allow complex things to be complex. Now, I'm not here to tell you that I made a tool that summarizes privacy policies for you. I'm not going to summarize them for you either. What I am offering you, however, is an alternative way of looking at existing privacy policies. We're going to take a small handful of examples, and I'm not going to be picking on any of the companies and apps that are called out on this video. I really want you to judge these things on your own, because we all have different comfort levels with all of this stuff. I don't tend to trust folks who tell me how to feel, and that's why I'm not going to tell you how to feel. I respect your ability to judge a situation when you are provided with all of the context. With all of that out of the way, let's start digging into this. One of the reasons I find privacy policies to be complicated is the wall of text. I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking for. However, I recently found something that could be a fantastic starting point. On Apple's App Store, towards the bottom of an app page, they have this. It's a categorized version of a privacy policy for an app. Now for full transparency, Apple does not review these and they are filled out by the companies who make the app, but this is still a great starting place for us. Apple provides the people who make apps a guide on what each of these terms means and examples on when to use them. If we jump down to types of data in this developer guide, we can see the same categories that come up in the App Store. Now, I took this as a starting place and I made a simple visualizer using similar language as Apple's. I understand that not everybody uses an iPhone or even a smartphone. I mean, I don't use one. My point is not to praise Apple, as I am very critical of that company. But I do want to point out that they have a really solid foundation here. Plus, a majority of the people in the United States do use an iPhone, and so I also thought using familiar visuals and language would be helpful. Each category can be tapped or clicked, revealing blue, then orange, then red. My thought process was to let you determine how you've ranked these colors. Let's say you're not comfortable with precise location collection from apps or services that shouldn't really need it. You can set it to red for bad. Or let's say you track it based on data not linked to you, data linked to you, or data used to track you. Bam, three colors for each type. Additionally, I added a description to each category so you can learn what it may contain. I also included some situations where the data collection makes sense, as well as some situations where it might be problematic. 
Lastly, I added search terms, which is a list of words or phrases that you can use to search in a privacy policy, just to quickly judge if you're comfortable with it or not. I want to run through each of these categories quickly, and then we can look at some real-world examples so you can get an idea of how this all could look. Health data is anything that tracks health metrics, like anything that would be entered into a health insurance app. But it can also be anything that uses the same sensors that health metrics are measured from. For example, the gyroscope in your phone is used to track steps as you walk, but it is also used to determine what orientation your phone is in. I found that a lot of apps use this category in the app store solely because they use the sensors to know how your phone is moving, but they don't use it to track actual health information. This is the guidance from Apple, which when I started looking into this, I wouldn't have expected sensor data to be in this category, so that's good to know. If you're looking at an app in the app store that says they collect health data usage, read the privacy policy and see what they're actually tracking. It might not be as bad as you're expecting. Purchases are just for tracking your purchase history when you use an app and service. This data is mostly used for identifying patterns and trends in your spending behavior, which is really valuable data to share with advertisers. I noted in this category that its benefit is also its downside, advertising accuracy. This one really depends on what you're comfortable with. As far as data that is shared and sold, this is one of the most abstract feeling to me, so I could see it going either way. Financial information is pretty self-explanatory. It's any information related to your finances. This includes things like your credit card number or your bank information. Now, a lot of services use third-party payment platforms, and I want to note that if a company uses a third-party service like Stripe, PayPal, or Venmo to allow you to pay for things, they are not required to disclose what those services collect. Because you are using the service, though, it is assumed that you agree to the other service policies as well, even if you've never looked at it. As tedious as it can be, I really encourage you to read the privacy policies of the popular payment platforms so that you understand what they also collect when you use a service that uses them. I call this out because it's a regular practice, and oftentimes these third-party services do the exact same thing. It can be a bit of a rabbit hole, but just be aware of it. Additionally, financial information is one of the most sought after when it comes to data breaches. It is very lucrative to try to steal this data, so please keep that in mind as well. Location was actually really interesting to look into. I hadn't ever looked into the accuracy of these devices, I just assumed they knew what general building I was in, but it is far more interesting. So there are two levels that Apple uses, course location and precise location. They note that course location is the first two decimal places of longitude and latitude, and anything beyond that is considered precise location. Here's a visual of what that looks like. Starting with the course location, we'll look at the first decimal place, which is a 6.9 mile diameter circle. This can clearly identify what city you're in, but that's about as certain as it can be. Remember, the circle isn't always centered on you. You can be anywhere within that circle. Second decimal place is a half mile diameter circle. Now this is clearly much more accurate, but this is clearly just accurate enough to tell what neighborhood or village you're in. This is as good as it gets for course location before we start getting into precise location. From here on out, we are now in precise location territory. The third decimal place is a 360 foot diameter circle. This is enough to see what building you're in. The fourth decimal place is just a 36 foot diameter circle. This is able to pinpoint your phone's location to be an area within a tennis court. The fifth decimal place is only a three foot diameter circle surrounding your phone. Accuracy at this point is starting to rely less on GPS and more on other tech like Wi-Fi triangulation, ultra wideband, and Bluetooth. Remember that when an app or service requests precise location, they can absolutely stack these types of tracking technologies to make it even more accurate. Which brings us to the final six decimal place. This is as accurate as a modern iPhone 16 can be pinpointed, down to the half inch. That is the thickness of a AAA battery surrounding your phone. Again, this relies on wireless technologies aside GPS, but one of the most popular accessories for the iPhone is AirPods. Those assist in helping pinpoint where your phone is, as well as other Apple products like AirTags, MacBooks, iPads, even other iPhones that are nearby, as well as all the other Apple accessories that other people are using nearby. And nearby is about a 30-foot radius circle surrounding your phone, assuming it's just Bluetooth that's being used. 
For Wi-Fi, it can be up to a 150-foot radius circle, but at that point you're getting into the fifth decimal place of accuracy, which again is a 3-foot diameter circle. Fun fact, this accuracy is still there when your phone is off. Apple saves a small portion of the battery that you can't access to ensure that the ultra-wideband antenna can be used to track your phone in theft situations, as well as other iPhones and accessories. Moving on, contact info is information that can be used to contact you. This includes things like your full name, phone number, email address, physical address, and any other methods that can be used to contact you. This information is among the most commonly revealed when breached data is in a data breach. Contacts is access to your contacts list. This is normally used to see what of your friends may be using a service. This is also essentially giving out the same contact information we just talked about, but for every contact saved in your phone, and without their consent. Again, there's a reason that names, phone numbers, emails, and addresses are the most commonly revealed in a data breach. It's because contacts is also looped into that data collection. User content is anything created by you. This ranges quite a bit, so we'll break it down. First is emails or text messages, meaning the content of a message as well as the subject line and who it was from and who it's going to. This also includes in-service app messaging, so Snapchat's chat feature counts as emails or text messages. Next is photos or videos. These are photos or videos that you have in your photo library that you upload to a service. Instagram uses this data type to allow you to upload photos. Apple does allow you to restrict what photos are able to be accessed by an app, but you can share your entire photo library as well. Audio data is like your voice or sound recordings. An example of this would be using the voice search within the YouTube app. Gameplay content is recordings you capture of gameplay. Lastly, customer support content is anything you create during a customer support request, like screenshots of an issue. User content covers a pretty wide range, so it's important to read the privacy policy to find what things they collect and draw the lines where you're comfortable. Like customer support data makes a lot of sense to retain, whereas maybe audio data might make you uneasy. Next category is search history. This is anything that you search for within the service. In the case of a shopping app like Amazon, this data is mixed with the purchases data to show you things that you'd be more likely to buy based on your searches. Browsing history is anything you look at outside the service. This is mostly attributed to cookies from what I can tell, and other similar third-party tracking tools. I've been wanting to make a video that explains cookies in far more detail, so leave a comment if you think that would be helpful. Identifiers are methods of identifying you or your device. For you, it's oftentimes a username, whereas your device is a unique ID that is assigned to it for advertising or other purposes. This type of data is very common, and weirdly enough, might not be considered directly identifiable on its own, despite its name. Usage data is how you use the app or service. This tracks things like what you click, how you scroll, when you scroll, when you pause scrolling, when you engage with something like a comment section, or liking a post. This data can be used to make suggestions based on your behaviors within the app. Think YouTube or TikTok. Both platforms pay attention to what videos you stick around for and which ones you stop watching. That data is fed into their algorithms, which makes your feed feel more personalized. Sensitive data is a big category. This data includes racial or ethnic data, sexual orientation, pregnancy or childbirth information, disability, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, political opinion, genetic information, or biometric data. This data normally is associated with apps that are handling sensitive information, like an insurance app, but it can also be collected if you offer it. It is also obviously highly sensitive data, and has been breached before, like with a data breach of 23andMe we saw a while back. Diagnostics is data that is used to inform developers how their app is working on your phone. If you open up the app, but you push a certain button and it crashes, that crash log gets sent to the developer so they can try to resolve that very issue. Other data is any other data I did not mention here. This can include things like data captured from the LiDAR sensor on your phone, but most apps that use that sensor from what I've seen don't actually collect it on their end. Now, let's jump into a quick example. I'm going to start with drawing some lines. I am fine with health data being tracked so long as it's a health app. 
If it's not a health app, it's a red flag if it's collecting things like my steps or my sleep patterns. Additionally, I don't want an app collecting any sensitive data, nor do I want my precise location to be collected. Everything else, I will judge based on how they present it. I'm going to pull up the Apple App Store page for Spotify because they have some of these categories already highlighted. But I want to show you why this doesn't tell the whole story. Here, you can see that they say they collect health data, but I can't tell why. Let's read the actual privacy policy to see what's going on here. Since I want to look for something specific that I'm not sure about, I'll start by using the search terms that are in the privacy visualizer. Let's start with steps as a search term. Nothing comes up. Okay, let's try another one. Sleep patterns this time. Nope, same thing. So what is Spotify collecting that uses health data? If you recall, health data also contains things like sensor data, so let's look for that. Okay, so they just see how you're holding the device. It's certainly a little weird, but it's not really a red flag for me, so I'll mark it as blue on the privacy visualizer. Now, I admittedly wasn't paying attention to anything else, I just wanted to see if that one thing was weird or not, so now I can continue from the top, marking things as I read them. I'll speed up the footage here so you can see how I read it and mark these things along the way, but I hope that you can see how this is helpful. You can judge these things on your own, which helps you understand what's going on and what you're comfortable with. I know this is kind of a simple tool, but that's kind of the point. I want this to be accessible. If you have found this to be helpful, let me know in the comments. I'll have a post on the forum on how I made the site, so if you want to make a similar one for yourself, or maybe you have better ideas on how mine could be better, go build it. Anyways, please be kind and patient with one another. Peace. I'm gonna go on living like I never met you And it'll feel wrong at first, but I think I can forget you Ignore the fact that we sleep no more than three feet apart I feel you now, you're all around me